Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. On this week's episode, Dave shows you his holiday slides. Only kidding. Well, sort of. We have a really exciting episode for you involving dinosaurs, new science and even a house made out of bones. Hello everybody and welcome to episode 6. We're halfway through the year already and we are recording, obviously welcome to Terrible Lizards, this is a podcast where I am Izzy Lawrence and with me is Dr David Hone, paleontologist extraordinaire. He has superpowers, Uh, he won't tell you what they are though, so he's also frowning (laughs) at that. Because I haven't worked it out yet. (laughs) Scepticism is his superpower. Um, so yes, um, I don't know what this um, episode is going to be all about, Dave. But could it be possibly that you went to Utah? Uh, it could be that I went to Utah and briefly Colorado, which I wasn't aware of at the time that the trip got organised because it was that sort of field trip, pretty much. Excellent. So I want to know all about it now. For those people who don't know what we do, Dave is not going to show you the equivalent of the slides here. We are going to talk paleontology. We are going to talk dinosaurs and everything else but part of being a paleontologist is going on field trips like you do at school where you get those little like sandwiches in your little paper bags Ugh. and you get lost in the museum and you have to wear a coloured hat it's a bit like that it's like that but subtly different also okay <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, yeah, you, you'd sent me off with my microphone to do a daily recording like what I done did in Mongolia, only I sort of didn't, but also the way the week worked out, it didn't really make sense to do it like that anyway after the first couple of days, and so we didn't, and therefore here we are now. <laughs> so the idea is to do some kind of roundup, which I'm going desperately to try and avoid turning into a what I did on my holidays. <laughs> but I did see a whole bunch of things that I've wanted to see pretty much as long as I've been involved in dinosaur work and it sort of works around all manner of things that we talked about in the past and therefore I thought it might be quite enlightening to talk about some of that stuff. Well, I was I was wondering um, if you could maybe set the scene for us on why Utah and Colorado are important paleontologically. So it's, it's the Morrison formation, basically, which we've talked about on numerous occasions and, of course, Yes, there's lots of other dinosaur bearing and other fossil bearing formations in Utah and Colorado and lots of other places. And the Morrison Formation extends past a whole bunch of other states as well. So tell us about the Morrison Formation and what it is. So the the Morrison is a late Jurassic formation and it's massive. It's a it really does have exposure in huge swathes of kind of the Midwest US think pretty much from montana to new mexico though don't quote me on that but you know pretty much from almost border to border not quite but getting on for it and it's really really important because there's huge amounts of fossils have come from there really famous stuff diplodocus brachiosaurus stegosaurus allosaurus ceratosaurus camarasaurus um, these are all names which come up pretty regularly here, Apatosaurus, um, and a whole bunch of others which might be less familiar but are also quite often important and interesting as well. Um, so that's the first kind of big deal. And the second thing I think is historically in terms of context. So we've talked about the early days of dinosaur research, you know, the kind of 1820s, 30s, 40s in the UK, finding that early stuff, Megalosaurus, Iguanodon, things like this, and stuff kind of being triggered as a result of this. But ultimately, a lot of that research not just in the UK but was then as it was spreading out to other countries and people recognising oh we've got dinosaurs too this is all part of a big thing the Mesozoic is not just marine reptiles but there's terrestrial stuff as well dinosaurs are a thing and I would say at least it really kind of took off as a result of people starting to find the Morrison formation so most notably there's a thing called Bone Cabin Quarry and this is literally where one of your old timey presumably guy with two cows and a little covered wagon and dying of dysentery on the way crossing the u.s <laughs> uh stopped at a place where the dinosaur bones on the ground were so numerous he built a house out of it wow there was a literal bone cabin built of sauropod limbs well i mean that's cheating to do it with sauropod limbs if you did it with like you know like tiny little in a yeah, tyrannosaur rat, phalanges so. it would it would have taken a while um but like this is the kind of numbers that of things that were being found out of the ground you know the famous bone wars cope and marsh ultimately the bone wars were probably more about the mammals than other things Mm. but they took 
took in stuff like pteranodon, they took in early birds, they took in footprints, but also the Morrison was a fairly big part of that. Lots of that stuff was dug up by Cope and Marsh and others in this kind of great dinosaur prospecting rush. So this is something I've never visited and never seen. Yes, there's casts of Diplodocus Dippy all over the world. I have been to the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh where they have the holotype, the original Diplodocus Carnegie of the famous Carnegie Quarry in Utah. They have the original Apatosaurus. They have material of Stegosaurus and Allosaurus and Martiosaurus and a whole bunch of other very important things. I've seen various fossils. There's a uh, Barosaurus, so almost like a long-necked Diplodocus, if such a thing is I easily know, imaginable. Diplodocus has a long neck. Yes. A very long yes, tail. Yes, it does. And Barosaurus has a really long neck. Even more than Mementisaurus. No, but long for a okay. Diplodocid or Diplodocine. I'm not sure which. Um, but anyway, like I've seen a whole bunch of Morrison stuff. Um, if you've been to a museum, almost any major museum in Europe, sooner or later you've seen some Morrison stuff because a lot of this stuff, either the originals or again, classic casts like Diplodocus Stegosaurus, are knocking around. However, going to some of those sites, seeing some of those original quarries, some of which have still have the bones in situ, seeing the landscape, speaking to a lot of the researchers who work there and do this as their kind of day-to-day stuff, this is all something that I've never done, never had the opportunity to do, and so bringing that together was a pretty big deal for me in a lot of ways, and therefore I hope to communicate some of that in a whole podcasty type Okay, thing. so this is you fanboying over rock. Yeah, I mean, a little bit, to be honest, but again, some of it is very, very, very cool, and some of it was... <laughs> Very, very, very tedious in the classic sense of paleontology. Okay, so where are we going to do it like your holiday? So where are we well, going first? I mean, first? It, it, it makes sense, to be honest. Uh, it's easiest to remember it that way. So I flew into Salt Lake City, uh, where I was picked up by uh, Matt Wadel, who we've mentioned lots of occasions before. Yeah. Matt is a sauropod biologist. He and I go way back, though. Actually, we were working it out, and we think we've actually only published two papers together, possibly a third, though as a result of some very long drives around utah over the week that i was there we've had lots of very long conversations and we've got some really good idea about sauropod ecology though given the rate at which (laughs) and i have collaborated on things before we might make some notes by (laughs) 2037 and (laughs) the paper might have appeared by the time we've retired but yeah matt picked me up and basically we drove south for almost an entire day or at least for a very good chunk of a day um we picked me up in the evening stayed overnight and then and then drove and drove and drove and drove basically to a long way south uh to a um a branch off of a place called green river which i believe is linked to the famous green river formation which again is something that probably everyone has seen in a museum even if they don't know it so just as a short sidetrack so green river isn't mesozoic um it's post the kt extinction so it's more modern than okay. that okay but almost every time really not flattened so it's a lagerstatten so we've talked about lagerstatten before with our pterosaurs and archaeopteryx and various exceptional that's the one in germany well it's it's yes they are but the the lag lagerstatten being a german word but that is applied to any of these kind of beds of exceptional preservation particularly where everything's been squished so the green river formation is a lagerstatten and there's really cool stuff there's very early fossil horses there's some of the earliest fossil bats you know we're talking about like 55 million years old you know this is not too long after the KT and millions and millions and millions and I'm not exaggerating of fish every museum I went to went here's a wall of green river fish or a wall of green river plants or both and often spectacular preservation you know absolutely incredible um so that I believe is the town of green river and indeed the green river that flows through the green river is the same as the green river formation but that's not where the fossils come out very annoyingly because I saw it on the map and he map was oh we're turning off at green river it's like oh is that green river formation yeah but we don't see anything there I actually quite wanted to stop there even though it's oh, you built that up Dave and I let did, me down I I did I did build it up but at least I went through it should probably say actually on the way we stopped at a very small town called Price so this is a kind of recurring theme so even at the kind of first gas station we stopped at 
and you there's a little you know you always get that just inside the door usually of gas stations and museums and things there's the little leaflets describing local places that you can go and things that you can do stand i think we've all seen them and it has a they, they have a thing called dinosaur diamond there are so many fossil sites and famous places and little museums and roadside attraction type stuff that, that there's a whole little pamphlet that you can pick up to try and visit everything around it and we did probably kind of two-thirds of the big ones in in just over a week. Uh, and Price was the first of these. So it's a very small town. I mean, literally drive across it in five minutes. And it's got a fairly sizable dinosaur museum. Um, <laughs> you know, just in this, it's, you know, it's like $6 to get in. And yet, a whole bunch of casts of some very nice stuff that was really nice to see. So, like, there's a Diplodocus and an Allosaurus and a Stegosaurus. And I think it was a Camarasaurus. And then a painting of Brachiosaurus on the wall. A whole bunch of Ceratopsians. Five or six different Ankylosaurs. Two of which I don't think I'd seen before at this point. Though, as I soon discovered, were also in the other museums. So, you know, this... this like, like, it would, you know, if you put these in the UK, it would probably be the second best collection of dinosaur skeletons and casts after the Natural History Museum. And yet it's in a town with a population, I guess, of like 20,000. <laughs> it's amazing. That, you know, we're, we're, we're just, we're, you know, we're just on the wrong continent for this stuff. But amongst all that stuff, oh, and a whole nice section of relatively recent stuff. So cave bear, Smilodon, early Native Americans, mammoths. Uh, wolves and some other stuff. I was going to pick you up on Smilodon because I think everybody else can work out what a bear is. Describe a Smilodon. A Smilodon or Smilodon, depending on your pronunciation, the, the classic saber-toothed tiger. Big. Though it's not a tiger. It's got a short it's little not. tongue. Um, yeah. But, but it's got it's the big sa- teeth. <laughs> it does have a saber-toothed cat. But yeah, um, but then, it, you know, amongst all of this, again, for such a tiny place with some absolute gems. So the first thing that I saw is they had some casts of, I think it was Kepodactylus, so a pterosaur. Uh, the Morrison, despite having produced unbelievable amounts of dinosaur bones, and particularly sauropod bones, and quite a few pterosaur tracks, is basically devoid of pterosaur bones. There's some tiny fragments knocking around, and then a couple of very partial skeletons this is one of those very partial skeletons the morrison formation isn't one of those volcanic ash formations so it's no, not going to preserve not. The there, there's, bones there's all as kinds well. of different things you know yeah there's 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 mudstone and there's clays and sandstones and various other things so yeah the morrison extends over such a big area and such a big w- w- window of time it's millions of years it's much much longer than your average formation that we've talked about in the past or, or, or almost certainly well in the future you know but it's a really big chunk of time you know often when we're talking about formations we mean a few hundred thousand years at most in this case we definitely mean like half a dozen million years it it's big so there should be some more pterosaur out there it's weird just how rare they are yes pterosaurs are hard to find they don't preserve well outside of exceptional preservation but when you've dug up this much stuff and we found loads of tracks so they're definitely there um there should be more but yeah capodactylus they they had casts of the skeleton the cast was so good i thought they were original the bones even though the sign said cast i even went and asked the guy at the front desk to confirm it they were that good you basically couldn't wow. tell um wow. and it's a weird critter because i was immediately convinced it was a ramphering kind so very much like ramphering cuss uh because it had an incredibly weird humorous and then like reread the sign and went it's a pterodactyloid it's a tenochasmitid so just like pterodactylus you know little filter feed that he went no it isn't not with that humorous and then looked at the other bones and went yes it is but it's got boy has it got a weird humorous <laughs> that's odd as hell um, and the humorous so that, is is the upper arm upper arm bone yeah so they're, they're really distinctive in remphorine kinds because they're really curved and then have this really weird crest on them and this thing had basically those two features um, but all the bones were found together. I'm, I'm sure it's not a composite. It's just got a weird humerus, probably to do with how it's flying. Uh, but that'd be really interesting. I, I want to go back over my photos. I want to go back to the original paper and reread it and look at it because, you know, photos and drawings can only tell you so much when you've actually seen the 3D things and you've, you've got a feel for it. So that was a lovely little find. Um, there was about half a Allosaur skeleton on the wall, which was quite nice. Wow. Um, no head, unfortunately. It was basically oh. a neck and body, but still very very nice how, skeleton i always get confused about how big allosaurs are because you know in my because uh, they're much smaller than t-rex obviously but how big are they well not necessarily that much <laughs> um so this is this is one of those problematic things that you have um i think we mentioned this with triceratops before like as a kid going to the natural 
Evolution Museum, there's a Triceratops skeleton. And my brain goes, that's how big Triceratops is. And then you find that he's the equivalent of a human who's about four foot ten. I mean, (laughs) you know, Triceratops just gets massively bigger than that thing. And it's even the, you know, kind of middling sized adults are much bigger than that skeleton. And you just don't get that. Uh, So there's a, I think there's a kind of similar thing going on with a lot of dinosaurs where we have a decent number of bones. And we'll come back to that later as well for Allosaurus. There's some big ones, you know, there are some proper big ones who I would say are probably Albertosaurus size. In other words, 10 meters, very, very sizable animals indeed. And we should describe an Allosaurus to those who do not know what we're on about. Because occasionally we do this, Dave, we go off about a dinosaur and and then people are like, what? What is that? Possibly unfairly. I think Allosaurus is kind of the default dinosaur, or the default theropod, anyway, default carnivorous dinosaur. It's brought around with two legs. It's got relatively big arms with relatively big claws on them and a fairly generic head with not particularly distinctive teeth. In I mean, sharp, curvy teeth, but not lots of little ones and not big, fat ones like Tyrannosaurus or anything like this. It does have a pair of fairly big crests over the eyes, which often get completely overlooked in illustrations and diagrams and other things, particularly, you know, older, cheaper books. But if you want a fairly generic, average carnivorous dinosaur, I think Allosaurus is a pretty good bet. And a lot of them are kind of six, seven, eight metres long. That's a very big animal that they definitely wouldn't want to meet on a dark alley or even in broad daylight. Unless the alley was very, very narrow and it couldn't get in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, you know, the, the big ones are probably over 10 metres. And there's a, for want of a better phrase, a giant animal, a giant carnivorous dinosaur in the Morris called Saurophaganax, so the the lizard the reptile eater basically a eater of reptiles and this is one of those things which at least a couple of listeners ears will have perked i'm going oh i've heard of that thing isn't it just a big allosaurus well a bunch of people who know theropod taxonomy and anatomy much better than me are quite happy with the idea that it's not just a big allosaurus it does look weird it doesn't look you know it's got features which we wouldn't predict there to be present on an animal of that size and this is a classic thing where it got named a whole bunch of people have kind of looked at it and gone yeah probably and one person once said actually i don't think so i think it's just a big allosaurus and that paper was kind of problematic in some of the way they handled some of the characteristics and since then you know it is about every three months on reddit i see saurophaganax is just a big (laughs) allosaurus because one person said it once 20 years ago whereas 20 other people have said no it is definitely different saurophaganax is out there that's weird um so that's a real it saurophaganax whatever it is is very closely related to allosaurus i do think it's probably distinct it's probably worthy of a name in the lack of any better evidence but that's a proper you know 12 ish meters Whoa. maybe we're, we're getting on to you know good sized t-rex size at this point nothing like as heavy they're nothing like as well built but there are some big big carnivores in the morrison and just to just to add you know for people who are because we do get new listeners every month and you guys might want to know this um you measure your dinosaurs from nose to tail you don't measure them that's not how high they were that's nose no, to tail that, is their length, length which is something that i specifically published papers about saying we shouldn't do um <laughs> <laughs> because because but, of the variability of the tail and the uncertainty of a lot of these measurements. However, it's easiest to do it, particularly in a forum format like this. So yeah, so they had an Allosaurus skeleton at price. Um, and then the other thing they had, which I was super excited to see, and so was Matt, and he'd been there before, and I think he just like missed this, or it was newly put on display. They had a Stegosaurus gula armor, which was like, yeah. Okay, so so hang on. I want to, I want to say, I think I'm right in saying that Stegosaurus gula is the animal, and it's not some armor that's protecting its ghoulas. No, it is some armour that's protecting its ghoulas. It's throat. Is it? It's Amazing. throat armour. We, we've definitely mentioned this before. This is one of those things that like you keep seeing illustrated in papers and talked about and like, oh yeah, Stegosaurs also had like a whole bunch of little bony nodules basically running from like their chin down to their chest so that they had like an armoured, almost like chain maily sheet of bone in the, protecting their throat. And this is, this comes up again and again and again, like loads That's of people mention weird. it. And then you actually try and find it in the literature, in the scientific literature, and it basically doesn't exist. And then you see photos of it, but obviously from casts and not like, you know, or someone might have sculpted it and were like, where's the original? No, they've got some original Stegosaur Gula armour. And you're like, oh, I've finally seen it. And it actually exists. And here it is 
isn't a real museum with a catalogue number. And we took loads of photos of this like block, like a, about the size of like a big dinner plate. I'm thinking of iguana, iguanas, not iguanodon, but actually iguanas. They've got like big goiters, haven't they, that are around their necks. Yeah, is it a bit but like that's that? more a kind of display thing. No, this this is, I mean, it's it's hard to describe. Um, I mean, the, the obvious thing to say is it's quite a lot like some of the ankylosaur armor. But of course, if you haven't seen that, <laughs> sure. this really isn't very helpful. But people understand the ankylosaurs with the big swishy tails. And, well, you I'm know, looking at my desk plating. and I'm seeing a pile of pound coins. I bet if you've got a big handful of coins and just smush them together on the table and then like put that in a layer of skin, that sort of thing. Okay. So a whole bunch of kind of 10, 15 mil diameter blobs and just stuffed them all together. And so obviously it'd be flexible because there's blobs and they'll move in the skin, but also pretty hard if you hit them. You wouldn't want to. You could break your teeth. And that sounds like that's an, a defensive you know, mechanism to stop their necks getting ripped open. Yeah, their you know, their tails would have been their primary form of defence, particularly against predators. But the head's still vulnerable if you bite it. But, you know, particularly your throat, you know, carotid artery, your esophagus, your trachea. There's a lot of soft, squishy, instantly killy things down there. Covering that lot in armour, probably quite a good idea. So that was really, really cool to see. And, and remind me, because it's one of the most famous facts about Stegosaurus and T-Rex, is that T-Rex lived roughly as far apart from us as it did from the Stegosaurus. Oh, it's in the... much further from Stegosaurus. Okay, uh, good. To the, to the tune of like 20 million years or something. It's, it's not even close. So T Rex yeah. was there right at the end of the late Cret- Cretaceous, and the Stegosaurus was well Jurassic. end of the late Jurassic. But but yeah. yeah, but but the Jurassic, but the Cretaceous is really the Cretaceous is like almost half the Mesozoic. So yeah, yeah it it would and be. the Mesozoic for everybody listening is the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous, and Cretaceous. periods. So just so just because you know, I know we get new people listening. I don't want them to feel and like they should you know, go we're... back and listen to the other ninety I episodes they, before this one. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't. And, you Very know, inconsiderate and, of them. And also, it's a nice reminder for me when I say things like that that I'm not completely <laughs> talking rubbish <laughs> and I haven't got the wrong end. You of know the stick. some things. Um, so yeah, price, lovely little museum. Saw some great stuff. Really nice. Oh, cast of Utah Raptor skeleton. Ooh. So that's the first time I've seen that. Actually, it was a bit of a shonky one. It was clearly more sculpt than cast, but still the only one I've ever seen. Uh, so that was nice. And a really nice like bronze Utah Raptor outside, featherless because it was obviously quite old but very very nicely done took loads of photos of that in the sun and utah raptor is like a giant velociraptor i mean this is yeah basically i mean now we are talking two and a half meters to the top of the head um six seven meters long this is an you know this is an allosaurus sized dromaeosaur and robust with it they're they're well built so yeah very very cool animal i didn't get to the utah raptor stuff utah raptor is cretaceous It, it was not in the morrison but obviously it is very much from utah so yeah price price drove down to green river then past green river quite away out into the badlands and there matt has been going on a dig with brian eng the artist who may or may not have come up on here before but people people are probably aware of brian and john foster who is the um i forget his exact title but he's basically like museum director or chief paleontologist or chief curator or whatever of what's called the field house uh collection in Vernal, uh, which is a town in uh, close to Salt Lake City, where there is another museum full of dinosaur <laughs> stuff. Um, and John is married to Rebecca Hunt Foster, who is the equivalent job at the legendary Carnegie Quarry in Dinosaur National Monument uh, National Park. So, you know, obviously John and Rebecca, between the two of them, you know, really <laughs> kind of have the state sewn up. They're like the Kardashians. Of yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, nice. I, was, I'm, I met Rebecca years ago when she came to SVP in Bristol, which would have been like 12, 14 years ago. And then we were supposed to meet up with her. And unfortunately, she and John had to go to a memorial service for a relative. And so I saw John, but I didn't get to see Rebecca. So these, I mean, at this point, I think I'm just almost telling stories. But people ask, you know, what's it really like as Valen? this i met her once 15 years ago i was supposed to meet her again in the one week that i'm in the in her city visiting her collection and she had to leave the town and i didn't meet her but i finally met her husband after 15 years of not meeting him because he missed bristol actually i think he didn't miss bristol and i just somehow didn't meet him at the meeting this is very paleontological yeah so me brian matt john drove down with a visiting student who was over from bonn in germany uh, and a friend of brian's drove down to a site where they 
been excavating a brachiosaur. And I'm not giving anything away here because Matt's posted a whole bunch of photos of this thing on his blog, SVPAL. Brian's made a whole video about it and the excavation. They had to get horses in to get the bones out from the quarry uh, because you're not, you know, this is protected land. You're not allowed to take a vehicle in there. And so, so the solution was horses or at least a horse, uh, some dirty, Very great, strong horse. Sh- it's dirty, great, sh- not a shire horse. What are they called? Ah, the names escape me now. One of those really like proper big breeds, like bigger than a shire horse. They found a local farmer who had one who'd let them borrow it. Uh, Brian's made a whole video of this. If you search for Brian N-E-N-G-H on YouTube. I, and I also want to add that brachiosaurs are a sauropod, so they're like Diplodocus, except yeah, bigger. But except much bigger. So the, the they've got out two femora, two femurs, uh, left and right thigh bones. Oh, they're, they're one metre 80, one metre 90 long each. That's the femurs themselves, yeah, so not just, the Yes, yeah, exactly. so, so just, just one bone. The bone is bigger than I am. Yeah, by a margin. Yeah. So they got those two out, and brachios- brachiosaurs in general from just the femur you can't tell if it's brachiosaurus specifically or a brachiosaur could be a new taxon you can't tell there's not enough features basically but brachiosaurs in general are super rare in the in the morrison and i believe this one's quite a lot older than the others and again the morrison's really quite old so it's not quite a lot older as in 50,000 years it's quite a lot older as in like 2 million or something like this oh wow um you know this is quite a big deal um and they'd found some other bones in the quarry um the morrison is one of those places where you tend to get either a random bone or tons of bones and so once you find more than one you start getting excited and hoping there's quite a lot more there and once you found three four they've got out now already they were hoping for a lot more so basically they've been going back irregularly when time and situation allows and basically carrying on the excavation and we spent a couple of days digging a big hole in the ground and finding the square root of nothing um ah. so yeah that that was that was my field trip part is I, f- I found a handful of smashed bones on the surface which had been out for, for years and everyone knew about i didn't even find anything novel in that regard despite doing a bit of prospecting on the final day. Uh, well, the bones are going down into the hillside, which is really annoying because, you know, geology doesn't always line up nice and flat. This is going down, which means every time you want to go further in, you've got to go further down and you're clearing even more rock to get down, to get down, to get down. This thing was already found over quite a big area. It's obviously a very big animal. So just because you haven't collected, just because you haven't found anything for like three metres in any direction does not mean there's not more out there. And so this is what they're doing like hunting into the hillside basically trying to find more and basically we didn't but we got further along in the hole digging and seeing where things go proper paleontology digging yeah digging a hole and not finding anything again everyone gets super (laughs) excited about going into the field and it's like no it was stinking hot we got caught in thunderstorms there was like an almost sandstorm that blew like inches of sand into my tent so i got i got flooded out on the first night and then i got full of sand the second night (laughs) and then i dug a hole for two days and found nothing (laughs) this is normal (laughs) We're so, all so, going on yeah, so, so, sorry to holiday. dispel the wonderful myths about field work, but this is really quite common. Um, we did do some other stuff. Matt and Brian took me to a couple of other sites that they've been trucking around and looking for other stuff. There's some nice bones going into hillsides in some really, really hard rocks. There's a beautiful Haplocanthosaurus neck. Haplocanthosaurus is another weird sauropod. There's very, very few of them known. Only a handful of bones have ever been dug up, but it's got very distinctive vertebrae vertebrae so you you just need to see a broken one in cross section and it's instantly obvious what it is and there's a whole bunch of them in a rock and you can see we've talked about cervical ribs i'm sure so basically we have talked about rib, cervical rib ribs. bones on the neck though in sauropods they kind of point downwards back along the neck rather than kind of wrapping around like our chest ribs do and so you can see this haplocanthosaurus vertebrae like cut through in the rock and then you can see several circles either side of it and that's oh, the wow. ribs from multiple different pairs of ribs all lining up alongside it so you know it's not just one random bone that's a neck and you've cut through the middle of it and then if you go to the end of the rock you can see more ribs coming out at the other end so you know it's running through that chunk of rock really really cool but once again that means though dave that either and i bet you you're either gonna go back and find its head or you're gonna find its bum and considering 
it's a sauropod, its head is gone. Yeah, probably. Um, yeah. And and also this rock is, you know, like granite. Like you, you smack it as hard as you can with your hammer and your hammer goes ding and a bit like, you know, a chip off a sugar lump comes off and you're like, and then you like poke the bit of bone with your finger and it crumbles and you're like, we're never getting this... <laughs> <laughs> like you know we we can get the block out of the field but we're far more likely for the bone to disintegrate than us ever shift the rock basically it is horrible horrible stuff and once again you can't scan it because the bone and the rock are the same thing yeah it sucks yeah basically um but you know there are much there are other much much more productive and more uh, accessible sites out there is the good news but this one in particular could have been easier to deal with <laughs> Um, silly dinosaurs dying in the wrong place indeed um, so yeah so from there we went up to Vernal so this is back towards Salt Lake City kind of cutting across around a corner of the traditional diamond and to the Utah Field House of Natural History State Park Museum rolls off the tongue um, and the uh, God knows what the acronym of um, so yeah everyone calls it the Field House so it's another fairly moderately sized museum so rather bigger than Price but not like a grand natural history museum uh, that you might expect but again you know diplodocus in the hallway magnificent gift shop oh god that could have that could have been <laughs> so that's very what you expensive need in a museum. Oh. I, ma- I, ma- I managed to keep my hands in my pockets for most of it. Some really nice displays, huge stegosaurus limb, some really nice bits, but both fossils and cars, some really nice displays. One thing I'd never seen before, which was just amazing. So they've got the kind of classic diorama of here's our big dinosaurs, here's our sauropod, here's our allosaur, here's our stegosaur, and the usual mural on the back of the wall. And the mural isn't finished deliberately there are patches left in it because there are spaces in the diorama for things they still want to put in in the future nice and on the side they've got like a painter's scaffold set up with the spare paints and brushes and bones and then like built that into a glass case with bones and plates of the stegosaur that they want to put in there so they've turned it into part of the exhibit that we haven't finished the exhibit yet but this is what's going in it and this is why we've done it this way which was just lovely because it looks good as it is and then also if they ever finish it it it, it will look very nice as well i was at a school in bude right which had the history of time basically all the way around the hall and it started (laughs) it started in it was it was it was the history of like modern civilization so it started in Samaria, right. you know, you know, the cities, and it went all the way around to ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt was a long bit, and then it went to Rome, then it went all the way to the modern day, and then they had about three meters to carry it on. So. In future, when that stegosaur goes on there, this school is going to be like twenty. Yeah, they've, they've uh, tw- got another thousand years to fill in. And fifty-eight, there'll be kids going. Oh, I can put this on there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's quite cool, though. I yeah, like that. it was nice. Uh, so yes, yeah, so they had that outside. They had a whole bunch of life-size dinosaur models. Ooh. So apparently, there was a big, big place in town that made these and shipped them to countries or you know museums all over the world. Shut down, ran out of money and the museum bought all the leftovers so so they've got this real mix of like there's a horribly old shonky like 70s t-rex and a very tail draggy diplodocus but then some really nice protoceratops the allosaurus was brilliant they had a moss chops hooray bonus points for moss chops okay okay moss chops you don't remember moss chops i don't remember are you you, you're not old enough so when i was young there was a kid's animated show called moss chops narrated by bernard cribbins wow Wow. It was the, it was the usual, you know, all the random animals there. There was a T Rex, a an Ichthyosaurus, an Allosaurus, a Diplodocus, like, and they're all, fra- you know, there's like, oh, Uncle Diplodocus. How the hell is he your uncle? You're an Allosaurus. Um, <laughs> But like the hero was called Moss Jops. And Moss Jops is, you know, normally it's Andodimetrodon shoved in with the dinosaurs. Moss Jops is even older and even weirder and also on the, ultimately on the mammal branch of things. Okay. So I don't know why he was dreamed up to be put in this kids show. What does he look like? Four legs with a, almost like a really squat sauropod, actually, but like the neck's really bold, almost like crossing a sauropod with a giraffe. Because the neck's really bold, you know, sauropods have really long, skinny necks, really, yeah. and giraffe actually have pretty short, bulky necks. So, like a really short, squat, bulky giraffe reptile thing. But it was a nice model that looked good, and that was the important bit. Um, so, lots of other nice bits there. I gave a talk there to the Vernal Society of Paleontology, that was very nice. And then the really big thing, and this is what I've largely been building up to, is 
is going to the Carnegie Quarry in Dinosaur National Monument. And the Carnegie Quarry is one of those real holy grails of paleontology. I believe it, at well, the time that it was found and when it was uncovered, it was the biggest dinosaur quarry in the world. I think it's now the third biggest and I've been to the other two, which are both in China. So getting to the getting to completing the kind of set and particularly getting like the, the big famous one. So it, it's a wall of bones. It's it's about 45 degree angle. So it's going up um, ahead of you rather than being, you know, a truly vertical wall. And it's oh, 100 meters long, maybe a bit less, 80 wow. meters long and like 10, 12 meters bottom to top. And it's not quite entirely covered with bones. There's some patches with less and patches with more. But they've pulled out something like eight or nine basically complete skeletons from it. So the Barosaurus at the ROM is, for, is from there that I mentioned. Uh, there's this really famous baby Camarasaurus, which is in Pittsburgh. And there's copies in a bunch of other museums too. So they came out of here. And then there's all the others. So those are obviously missing because they were taken out. And then there's everything else. And there's just, just part and and everything's all mixed up so it's like you can really see like here's a couple of stegosaurus plates and the next one allosaurus femur and that's almost like lying on top of a diplodocus neck but with a camarasaurus skull and then there's an apatosaurus pelvis and then like a stegosaur neck vertebrae and then you know a little um so, ornithopod so, so what leg. happened all these dinosaurs died within a few years of each other or so at the same time you know or... th- there have been many many papers interpreting the carnegie quarry and exactly went on there one of which is mine and so not to bang on about my papers but this this is one of those ones where it's Dave, this is your podcast you were definitely allowed to do that well i know but <laughs> so we pro I, again you know now we well we're thick end of like 80 episodes in i can't remember what we covered at this point so a few years ago a guy called dan cherry who was the head of the that bit before rebecca took over posted on facebook here's a classic social media doing a good thing he posted a photo of a really small diplodocus leg on facebook and went here's a cool bone with some bite marks on it and i went i've never seen that before i've never heard of that before sauropod bones with bite marks on them or is it very much my thing how the hell is this not in the literature and why the hell does no one know about it if it's in the carnegie quarry one of the most famous dinosaur places on earth and particularly if you work there for decades as dan did you probably should have said something about this before so i emailed dan and went like have you published this and i've just completely he missed it he went no no one ever wrote it up wow. hint hint so he sent me a bunch of photos he took a cast of the because it's just a biting on the end so he took a cast of the end in situ because this thing's in the quarry and sent me that cast and between us we wrote a paper about this a to talk about the bite marks on the bone because they're quite interesting and weird and not like a lot of other bite marks you see in the morrison but also because it's the only bone with any bite marks on it in the carnegie quarry even though they've pulled out a couple of thousand bones by now and you would think if this is a classic kind of drought or even a classic flood situation which wiped out a whole bunch of dinosaurs whether they're all killed in the flood or whether there was a drought and they all came together and they all died and then got buried like a couple of carnivores will survive that and there's stuff everywhere eat it why is the only bone with any bite marks on this baby sauropod leg which now i've been there i realize i mean it was i knew it was among the other material is right alongside 50 other bigger bones com- which might have been covered in meat it, it's a very very odd situation indeed and i've never seen or heard of anything like it because the nearest comparable thing is actually the shantungasaurus quarry that i've worked on in china which is the world's biggest dinosaur quarry because there it's very obvious that this whole herd of dinosaurs basically tumbled and disintegrated like no two bones are together absolutely everything is separate you you can't f- and the small bones are mostly missing because they've just been washed away so these guys have just been completely torn apart by this event that buried them and the carnegie isn't like that here's a whole sauropod neck with a skull at the end that's the kind of thing which should utterly fall apart if you washed it away in a big flood with all the rocks and just other bones and bits of sauropod should just like shatter them and they're fine there's these complete articulated babies if that carcass is lying on the surface just eat it pull it apart eat it leave some bite marks drop some teeth no but they bit that one little bone down in the corner (laughs) so yeah what, what killed them? Finish the, it. 
Didn't finish it, did they, Dave? No, not even oh. that. So really not clear, I don't think, what actually killed them and really not clear what actually buried them. I mean, in the burial term, it kind of has to be a flood to bury a lot of big sauropods. And it's not fine ash, so it can't be a volcano. Yeah, and again, they but you, you haven't got lots of bones in a similar orientation, so that's a very common thing if you think about a stream. You know, it will tend to line things up because they would be the path of least resistance. It's not like it's washed away all all the smallest bones that's a very common phenomenon if it's very fast moving the small stuff goes the big stuff stays that hasn't happened some of it's very broken up some of it's entirely intact some of those intact bits are next to the broken up bits so it doesn't look like it's happened multiple times and multiple different events all at one it's a real confusion there are lots of scientific papers on this i won't pretend to have read most of them let alone remember the details it might be better worked out than this but my understanding from dan at least when we put this paper together I, it's only 28 18, 2019 it's fairly recent was we don't really know actually it's a bit of a mess and actually this bite mark thing doesn't help resolve it the only obvious answer is that it was the one bit that somehow was stuck up or it was literally just almost a random bite that an animal you know almost walking past picked it up bit it a bit and dropped it but it's right next to what appears to be the other leg well maybe yeah maybe it was already bitten when it died no because it because it's it's basically like up in the hip joint almost oh. it's the yeah it's the end of the head of the femur it's yeah it's weird but anyway it's magnificent zombies. like that's all i yeah. can say it's zombies yeah but but the carnegie you know it it's pretty much everything i thought it was going to be but that i built it up a lot you know bone after bone after bone after bone and just in one room you're seeing you know a dozen 15 species and where of a dozen of the most famous skeletons you know in museums around the world have ultimately come from even if they're not there now and there's some really nice diagrams on the wall and stuff seeing that little leg that i've worked on that was really cool for me as a personal thing well it is you know there's a little bit of my contribution to like one of the most famous dinosaur sites in the world one bone dave. and i hadn't seen it one yeah, bone in the yeah, most I've, famous i've formation. done it now i've done it and it counts <laughs> uh, that's what matters mm. <laughs> it's more than i've done dave yeah so you know absolutely you know just just wonderful and the, the weird thing is is like you know i took i took like 400 photos but there's only so much you can actually do because it's all just a bundle of bones and it's all been catalogued and described and and, and various things have happened to it so you, you i really was just kind of there for an hour you'd think like oh you take two days looking at it. it's like well no because it's if i want to see photos i've got the photos if i want to measure them it's all been done but you said it was like 10 to 12 meters deep so have they gone in down and no what i mean is the kind of top to bottom so yeah they they've okay. stripped it off what i hadn't realized until i got there and matt showed me is you walk outside of the room because basically they just put some scaffolding over it and put glass around it it's it's nicer than that but that's largely what they've done you walk outside and there's bones sticking out of the rock into the car park they haven't finished exposing everything and i asked well why the hell not if it's carrying on into the car park and this is one of the biggest and best sites in the world he said because this was done with andrew carnegie's money i mean he was the you know musk or bezos of his day and he basically said here's a blank check check dig it up and matt said the stuff is like concrete like you you're, you're chiseling off like an inch an hour this was hundreds of people for years working on this and you know that money just doesn't exist anymore or at least you know people with that money are not just giving it to dinosaur national monument to to do that sending cars to space yeah pretty much but yeah you know brilliant and wonderful and just you know an absolute joy to see and then from there we went to the cleveland lloyd quarry which is nothing like as famous but also very important so cleveland lloyd is the reason allosaurus in part is so well known is cleveland lloyd and it's getting on now for something like at least a minimum of 50 animals have been pulled out 50 allosaurus from one site wow yeah which for a big predator is weird so the interpretation of this is it's some kind of what we call a predator trap this is what la brea tar pits are supposed to be in la yeah an animal probably a herbivore gets stuck in mud or whatever it is that's going on and a predator goes in after it and get stuck and then the next one goes in after those two and gets stuck and so you're now in a position where what you've done is sample every predator from 20 miles around with one herbivore there's more than that there's some sauropod bones in there there's a very nice stegosaur in there and there's ceratosaurus and marshosaurus or other uh, 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 and torphosaurus i think so other big carnivores are in there but basically it's allosaurus heaven <laughs> quite literally because they are all dead so going there was 
far less is spectacular. So most of the bones are gone. So this is this really is a hole in the ground where bones were mostly. The stuff that's left behind is nothing like as nice as the stuff that's gone. However, what they have done for a lot of them is cast them. So there are a whole bunch of cast put back in the hole. And very nicely, actually, they were on basically little wire stands. So rather than just dumping them as a layer, they were put in at the right heights so that you could see that it extended across multiple different layers. You know, it wasn't just the horizontal area, it was also the different height and where they jumbled and how they lay with each other. So that was really quite cool. Yeah, I mean, we were there for like half an hour. You know, it's it's a hole in the ground with some casts of things you've already seen in it. But again, such a famous site. Were any of them holding anything? You know, one of them might have been like holding onto a rope to try and pull themselves out or something. Pull the others out, because, right. Well, the thing is, you we've already gone into Allosaurus arms and how weird they are and what are they for because they can't actually get their hands their mouths or something weird yeah I, I don't know what they're doing with them i don't think anyone does i mean the one thing they did have very nice allosaurus skeleton mounted cast but very very nice and some skulls of some other things i've never really seen before particularly ceratosaurus so ceratosaurus we've definitely talked about another big carnivore big crest on the nose and then little crests over the eyes and there's a skeleton which i think came out of cleveland lloyd but there's a skeleton of a red relatively small ceratosaurus probably six meters long or less actually so only about two meters tall my height big animal wouldn't want to tangle but that is again one of those ones that is in multiple museums i've seen that animal loads of times and it gives you a very full sense of how big ceratosaurus is and then this was the first place i saw a cast of the big ceratosaurus skull and it's sodding massive <laughs> it's <laughs> the size of the big allosaurus skulls ceratosaurus was not this little thing much smaller than allosaurus or at least at the upper end it wasn't it's just that every museum has the small one they don't have the big one and the big one is properly big um <laughs> yes you know eight, you know eight nine meter animal huge and so you've got these two allosaurus and ceratosaurus you've then got another thing called torvosaurus and then saurophaganax we have four basically comparable sized big predators knocking around together and this is in the jurassic period this is yeah. this is yeah this is late jurassic next up we went to to Fruta in Colorado, F-R-U-I-T-A. And there they have a place called Dinosaur Journey, uh, run by Julie McHugh. It's lovely to meet her finally. She's done lots of stuff on bike marks and scavenging. And they had loads and loads and loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of bones, all from a big quarry relatively close to Fruta, uh, which was just scavenged a bit. So there's just mostly sauropod, but huge amounts of sauropods, huge amounts of shed Allosaurus teeth, and loads of them have got bite marks on, which is just heavy for me in what was a spectacular little museum you know not very big i think i counted like 15 20 full skeleton cast and then about another 20 skulls on top of some dioramas and life reconstructions and some pterosaurs and turtles and loads of original bones out which is all really really nice so yeah had an absolutely spectacular day there poking around and, and seeing lots of stuff were it not for the fact that basically all this material was written up in a couple of relatively big papers in the last couple of years I could have spent a week there describing all these bite marks and scrapes and, and patterns and shed teeth. And, uh, they've done all this work, so it didn't need me. Anything that caught your fancy, though? Any, any good, really exciting bites that you weren't expecting? Any teeth left in bones, that sort of stuff? No, but there were there were lots of insect bites, which I've Ooh. seen in Mongolia and China on various things, but I hadn't seen in these kinds of in this kind of How can you tell their insect bites? Because obviously, you know, they've got to be... Is it just wear pattern or something? Yeah, it's basically the nature of the track, including quite a few snails. So there are, again, there are snails and beetle grubs which will browse on bone and these show up because the bones are really nicely preserved Hang and on, these traces are pretty good black adder joke from series one death by snail that is not that's not a real thing so it's not like this is snails eat bones. i mean it would it would, it would take a while yeah they, they'll get there eventually there are a whole bunch of carnivorous okay. snails I, I, did, I didn't know that i always thought the snails were loving things that sort of like hungry rocks really but also i didn't know that snails were around in the jurassic i presume they were because there was obviously crustaceans and stuff so yeah, yeah there's there's mollusks well ammonites they're mollusks um so yeah so loads and loads of bite marks lots and lots of very very cool stuff and i should get vernal i should have said i didn't really say for vernal lovely big collections haul out the back lots of artwork unusually in their collections lots of paintings of dinosaurs that locals have done over the years and some nice pterosaur tracks that i got to see 
and a new sauropod. Not a new species, but a new sauropod skeleton, which is really complete of a rare taxon that's oh, 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 coming. Oh. I'm told soon, though I, I'm told it's been soon for quite a few years now, so we'll, we'll hold off. And then basically finally back to Salt Lake City and the big uh, Natural History Museum in Salt Lake. That was spectacular. I mean, it's it immediately goes right up the list with something like the Carnegie or something like the Tyrrell Museum or something like Fukui in, in Japan as like one of the great museums I've walked around for dinosaurs. Lots of other natural history stuff as well and some local history, Native Americans, uh, First Nations peoples and their stuff and quite a lot of local wildlife stuff as well, which some of those museums don't do very well and, and they did pretty well. But they have got basically a big dinosaur hall and yeah, 20-odd skeletons. Wow. Six Allosaurus, I think it was, I'm trying to think there was a big one and then like five if not six juveniles all basically piling onto a barosaurus that was like drowning in mud and then behind the barosaurus is the dead stegosaurus that's being eaten by a mount of the big ceratosaurus and marshosaurus which is a relatively small theropod so just that diorama was five six seven eight nine skeletons and then they had two therizinosaurs i'd never seen them before before, so that's uh, the one with the, the snickety hands giant claws therizinosaurus has the particularly uh. giant scythe hands but it's part of a whole group and there's a bunch of them in north america and i'd never seen them uh so falcarius which is a relatively small one and then uh, nothronicus which is you know a, a properly big animal you know five six meters tall they stand upright so they're very tall for their for their kind of size it's, it's allosaurus sized basically and these are two herbivores never seen either of them utah ceratops so obviously a, a utah ceratopsian that's rather older cretaceous uh two tyrannosaurs lythronax and teratophanius both of which were named in like the last five six years and two skeletons of i think it was teratophanius they had two of a big adult and a mid-sized one so that's three tyrannosaurs mounted together what were they doing? Were they just having a cigarette or something? You know, just chilling. No, it's just two standing next to each other. But a, a nice hadrosaur, a nice ankylosaur. They, uh, they had the stegosaurus. Two Utah ceratops had a big one and a small one. And then a really famous wall of ceratopsian skulls, which a whole bunch of museums have this, you know, because they just mount the heads on the wall like, you know, like deer or antelope or other head shields like that. And then usually do a little phylogeny lines to draw them together. First of all, this one had like 14 or something. It was a huge number. And and secondly, a bunch of random stuff like uh, Coquila ceratops from Mexico, which again was only named a few years ago, and it's already... I didn't think they'd actually cast it yet, and it's already cast and up on the wall. What's, what's that one? Because Triceratops, basically, you could tell them apart because of their um, not only their horns, but their, yeah, yeah, they've all got different horn and horn and skull patterns. Ones that you just don't see very much. So, for example, you know, Triceratops you see every time, Centrosaurus you see every time, Pachyrhinosaurus you see every time, because these things are common. There are lots and lots of skulls of them, and they did have them, but then they had a whole bunch that you just didn't see. I'd have to go and look through my index, but I was really going. I don't recognise that. I don't recognise that. I don't have to recognise that, and had to go and look them all up. And are these big? Because I know, I know, I've, there's pictures of you stood next to. I think it was a triceratops you stood next to that was huge. Yeah, that was Dinosaur Journey. So that's one of the really big triceratops, where it's about the size of me, the head. You know, it's it's two plus meters from tip of the nose to the top of the frill. It's sodding massive. Again, you know, triceratops is way way bigger than people think it is. Probably two thirds of the skeletons, skulls, and other things mounted in that room were things oh, I'd never seen cool. before and so you know as someone who's been to a lot of museums and the fact that so many museums have the same things as all the other museums to be able to go into a room and go never seen that never seen that never seen that never seen that was was great and then some other nice stuff so they had a couple of nice dioramas with life reconstructions Doug Henderson who we definitely mentioned before he's like my favorite paleo artist ever sorry all my friends who are paleo artists but most of them would agree for a while I wrote a series of blog interviews with paleo artists asking them about their art and other people's and i said who's the artist you think is the best and basically there were three names uh, knight who did the famous murals in um, in america in the kind of early 1900s burian who was this extremely prolific guy working for many many years uh, i think he died in like the 70s or something but among the living people doug henderson and doug got name checked probably more than anyone else so in an interview with like 50 different artists
artist, like 30 of them listed him as their favourite. And he was one of them, <laughs> so he didn't name himself. So Doug's, Doug's my favourite, and they had a couple of... He, he did a lot of black and white, kind of like almost charcoal and pencil drawings, and they had these blown-up floor-to-ceiling. And bear in mind that this was like a four-ish story building for the space for the dinosaur hall. These were massive, and such a great backdrop, because all the bones are black from the quarries. So all these mounted skeletons I've described are basically stained black for the cast. So it's almost a kind of monochromatic dinosaur hall already. So actually it's a very smart move to use his black and white drawings for that. Just beautiful, beautiful setup. Looked really, really nice. A really dramatic and and clever use of the space and the animals they had. So yeah, that was pretty much the trip. It is one of those things where I think it kind of fills in your education and understanding. No, I didn't walk out of that trip going, haha, I'm going to write this paper on that specimen and... I've seen that and it's totally changed my appreciation and that paper I'd always planned to write or that book chapter or whatever I'm I'm going to redo or start again or da 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 But I think I've got a handle on the Morrison. Not a great one, but a handle in a way that I never had before and as one of the most productive, most studied, most famous and important historically sets of dinosaur bones ever, I now have a bit of a handle on it. (laughs) And that was always something that nagged at me that I, I should know this. The late Jurassic Morrison is like one of the places. That and kind of Hell Creek and the Ischian and the Solnhofen are, are the ones that almost everyone can name once they get started. And this was the last one that I'd never really done. You'd recommend for a dinosaur fan, for a dinosaur fan, this would be an excellent holiday, you reckon? Oh, God, yeah. If you've got a week, boy, will you get a lot done. I mean, there's some long days of driving, like Price. You know, it was like two hours driving to Price or three hours driving to Price from Salt Lake City, probably two hours in the museum and then a five hour drive to Green river the museum to drive ratio is not as high as you might like but what you'll see in those museums is you know phenomenal again even so you know price i keep coming back to simply because it's kind of small it's kind of out of the way and yet like i said if this was in the uk or even frankly in europe it would have one of the biggest numbers of dinosaur skeletons, even if they basically all cast on display. And if you want further holiday recommendations, you can listen to my other podcast, Your Place or Mine, on BBC Sounds. And also you do have news. Before we go, we've got to say about your kids' books. So I've got four books come out with Hatchet or Hache, I believe. They've all got dinosaur in the title. They're all different titles because they're all about different things. The publisher says age six to eight. I think you can probably go a bit higher than that, to be honest. I mean, I'm going to get them, so... Yeah, straight by a guy called Dave Smith who's really really good and what I like is they are cartoony they are fun and they are heavily stylized but they are also very obviously the dinosaurs they're supposed to be and also I think in the grand scheme of things as far as you can they're pretty good and I, I say that <laughs> with obviously um, a distinct lack of modesty but I think with kids books there's a real tendency to treat everything as fact and they like just telling you things and the publishers have been really quite good in letting me explain stuff and use words like maybe and perhaps and sometimes and probably and even go we don't really know it's like your catchphrase yes i know that's for a joke you know just getting some stuff in like there's a phylogeny in two of them this is great you don't get to do this normally and it's an accurate phylogeny as well with the right taxa in the right places even though no one will notice or so care. the link will be in the show notes but tell us at least one of the titles in full so people can google it other than Dave Hone children's dinosaur book. Who's bum did T-Rex bite? Which I think also shows you like where we're going. That's based on the famous uh, hadrosaur with the broken off T-Rex tooth in it. We've got some real, actual real research and actually relatively recent real research going into these books. And that's what I'm really proud of. I understand. Like I, in my books, The Time Machine Next Door, I managed to get people like, you know, Isaac Newton in there being horrible and also not caring about gravity and caring about optics because he actually liked that quite a lot anyway you know this is this is the fun thing where you actually have real facts in your books for kids that is exactly what i specialize in too i will link my books down there as well but do uh get whose bum did t-rex bite just for the title if nothing else so dave thanks for your holiday snaps very nice indeed where's the wine we will see you next time after three one two three thank you for listening to terrible lizards for extra content please go to patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards for questions contact us there or on terrible lizards pod at gmail.com 
by Dave Hone's Dinosaur Books, including How Fast a T-Rex Run. And to find out about Izzy's podcasts and books, head to iszi.com. Say hello on social media using the hashtag TerribleLizards. Thank you so much for listening. A review, a recommend and a follow makes all the difference. Stay stompy.